Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus. It's the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer, and we try our very best to understand what they're talking about. I'm Professor Matt Brown, and with me is Dr. Chris Kavanagh. G'day, Chris. How are you doing today? Watch a watch a top of the morning to you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, another special interview episode, I believe. And uh, would you like to introduce our guest? I will. And I'll just mention that it's on a topic we rarely discuss. Uh, these <laughs> people called the Weinsteins. Or Weinstein, I, I'm not sure. Weinstein. Yeah, you, people probably aren't familiar with them, but they're big figures online. But we, we don't have one of them here. However, we have the <laughs> next best thing, Tim Nguyen. So Tim is currently an engineer at Google, but previously a mathematics PhD from MIT. And relevant for us, he is the co-author with Theo Polya, who we'll discuss later, on a response to geometric unity. And this was a paper constructed from Eric's publicly available material where he described his theory of everything prior to his recent release of the paper. I mean, we can get into how the paper came about and the response to it and so on, but hello, Tim, and thanks for joining. Yeah, great to be here. I guess a little bit about me. So I got my PhD in mathematics at MIT in 2011, and it was in gauge theory. So basically the same subject that Eric studied at Harvard and significantly with the same sorts of lineage, because lineage sort of matters a lot in academia, so the same <laughs> style, the same sort of uh, conceptual framework. Did two academic postdocs, one at the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, the second one at Michigan State, uh, and then I left academia, also uh, unhappy, so actually we have a lot in common with Eric so far. Changed careers to go into machine learning, I joined a startup, and then I joined Google as a machine learning researcher in uh, 2019, and that's where I am right now. Great. And that's a much better introduction than I did. <laughs> so <I'm glad. laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because while we're talking about academia, technically my title is an engineer, but I like to call myself a researcher, which is actually correct because at Google, the distinction between engineering and research is, is actually quite blurred. And you could, you could be an engineer and be essentially a research scientist or, or vice versa. Uh, but anyways, I consider myself a researcher. Tim, this is a bit of an aside, but you mentioned leaving academia, not particularly happy with it. And it made me think, uh, I, I believe I've heard that it can be very, very challenging in disciplines like physics to um, just, it just, it just seems to be one of those kinds of fields where it's incredibly difficult for everybody really and incredibly competitive. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, that's certainly true. I think certainly theoretical physics is very much like that. I mean, I don't know what the ratios are, but it's probably something on the order of 60 to 1 or 100 to 1 in terms of faculty openings to PhDs. I imagine it's even probably worse in the humanities or, or not better, at, certainly. I think math is a little bit better just because in mathematics, every university needs calculus teachers, things like that. So maybe there's a factor of two better. But increasingly, it's, it's gotten quite bad where I think in physics, it's not uncommon to do three, maybe even four postdocs before getting on tenure track. I think in math, maybe one, maybe it's one postdoc fewer. So I did two. So maybe now the standard is to get two postdocs. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very, the bottleneck's pretty severe. It is. Yeah. Like I, I know that from my first postdoc was actually at a, a mobile robotics laboratory in Japan. Um, and most of us working there did not come through like a robotics pipeline. I came weirdly from <laughs> psychology and neurophysiology, but many of my colleagues came from a kind of physics track that like you moved uh, sideways, I suppose, into, into a related field. Yeah. Matt, just to lower the tone, when you said that we didn't come from a robotics pipeline, I was imagining a Futurama production line of robotic <laughs> humans being piped along. So I thought I'd just share that with you, that that's the well, image that pops to mind. Just to make just to make the metaphor even better, do you know what our mobile robots did? They inspected sewer pipelines. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Okay. That's, anyway, that's, enough uh, about me. <laughs> yeah, that's just peeling back the layers of the onion one episode at a time. But so, Tim, the the paper that you made, I think there's an interesting wrinkle about it. We'll get to Eric's response and all that kind of thing in due course. But so 
if I understand right and correct any of this that I've got wrong, your paper was produced prior to Eric's release on April Fool's Day of his geometric unity, his finally released in multi-decade preparation paper. But prior to that, he had repeatedly stated that all of the material you needed to understand his theory was available from the presentation he gave at Oxford and, and various online discussions that he'd given off the talk. So you and your co-author actually did a Herculean task of, of going through those materials and trying to extract the technical details such that they'd been specified before the paper. So first question, is that accurate about the genesis of the paper? And why were you motivated to do so if that, if that is how it came about? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so the, the video in question of the 2013 lecture was released on April Fool's Day, or maybe April 2nd, technically. Uh, I think there was maybe a YouTube mismatch that, that Eric had in the upload date, but it, it was April 1st or 2nd on 2020. The video came out, and then, and then finally the paper was released a year later, this year, April 1st, 2021. We released our paper last week of February, so mm -hmm. certainly it came out before the paper, Eric's paper, that is. And we had started working on it basically towards the end of 2020, start of 2021 in Theopolia. We were motivated to write this paper actually for, for several reasons. One, we had both independently talked to Eric on the Discord. So this was back when Eric was pretty active. I don't know how often he showed up, but let's say like on the order of once or twice a week. And actually, just let's just back up even further. I... I learned about Eric from a, a fellow coworker at Google. He knew that I didn't have a good uh, time leaving academia. And so he said, hey, you should check out this episode between Eric and Brett. And I actually, at the time, not being very critical and, and just accepting whatever I, I hear, I actually really enjoyed the episode. And I also recall being very surprised when Eric mentioned the Cyber Whitney equations, because why would I have expected that to come up uh, in a random you know, <laughs> podcast episode, right? And so I instantly felt a kind of, I don't know, bond, if you will, from listening to this podcast. And I, I was great. I started listening to more. And I also really enjoyed his episodes where he interviewed physicists, Roger Penrose, Garrett Lisi, because actually, from what I could tell, Eric does a good job talking about math and physics in those, those podcasts. I, don't, I, I didn't hear any mistakes. It was a very uh, enlightening, well-informed discussion. I mean, it wasn't like research material, but it's like, like I'm, lear I'm learning stuff. It's not just dull. It's not like too dumbed down. It's sort of like this very refreshing thing to hear like graduate level mathematics discussed in a podcast because it sort of allowed me a bridge of my former self out in you know the real world. Anyways, so I like it, whatever. And then I, I don't know, maybe a few months passed by and the same colleague said, hey, Eric is actually showing up on these Discord server voice chats. Maybe you should catch him. I said, oh, okay. So then at some point I installed the Discord uh, app and then I catch him at some point. Actually, even before that, I sent him a, a direct message on Twitter asking him, hey, I, I'm really a fan of your, your show. I, can you tell me more about the cyber Witten equations? Because you said that you had arrived before and I wrote my PhD thesis on them and you have to know more. And I was, I gave him all the benefit of the doubt. I had no reason to think he was lying or whatever, just like I would anyone make, just why would I think they're lying? And I even said, regardless of the outcome, I'm still a fan of your podcast. Now, of course, this is all true at the time of me writing them. It was all very sincere. Anyways, I didn't hear back. Not, not surprisingly, this is just a, a random DM on Twitter. Then not having heard back, I joined the Discord server. At some point, I catch him on the Discord in September. And, and so... That was when I first spoke to Eric. It was basically two occasions. It was the first time and then the second time. And just to summarize that, I introduced myself. He said he met my advisor, in fact. Uh, he knew who he was, said he was brilliant. Tom Rothka, by the way. And anyway, so the summary of that was I, I walked away realizing actually there's very little chance that Eric discovered the cyber Whitney equations. The, the, the stuff that Dan Gilbert went in depth about, the portal dynamics is basically all completely true. Um, and, and I'm the mathematician that he referenced there about the, the, the sign flip. Uh, I'm actually very impressed that Dan actually remembered the, the precise detail of that question. So anyway, so I walked away leaving very discouraged and frustrated because Eric was playing his usual sort of obfuscating tactics, not answering questions directly. Almost everyone else in that room was not a qualified 
math or physics person. And so, so Eric was just sort of spewing these analogies basically in bad faith because he has a theory of everything that he hasn't written up. Why is he wasting his time explaining gauge theory to people who don't even understand calculus, right? And mm -hmm. it, it was just a very weird dynamic. That's just not something you would be doing if you're like a serious scientist. Um, so I just walked away from that discouraged and just like, okay, I'm going to move on with my life, whatever. But because of that interaction, Dan was there or other people, but they said, hey, since you're like a math physics guy, you should like meet these other people. And that's how I got interested in Dan and, and, and Theo Polia, my, my co-author for the paper. Uh, so that's how I got in, in, this, in this circle of people. And actually the reason we wrote the paper was that a few months later, so Dan went on your, your show, right? And then I realized, wait a minute, there's actually a platform for sharing these whatever stories or just calling people out, if, you know, whatever you want to call it. And since Dan was able to do it in, in his way, it occurred to me that, wait a minute, since I studied the cyber witness equation, that I actually could take it one level further, it might make sense for me to start thinking about that. And then Theo was also interested as well. And then we started discussing all the various avenues. We actually thought that, so the, writing a paper was not the first thing on our mind. We were just trying to think, okay, what, whatever. Should, should, we, should we make a YouTube video? Should we just email Brian Keating and say, hey, this, this guy that you're interviewing, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We, we thought maybe Brian Keating was just, since he's an astrophysicist, he doesn't know mathematical gauge theory. Maybe he's just being legitimately conned. So Brian Keating is, is the professor who's been hosting Eric with two metric unity for many episodes and entertaining it. So anyways, we ran from like all the kinds of list of things that we might try to do and just writing a paper, it ended up being the most sensical thing because uh, we email someone as two nobodies, then like, why would they take us seriously? So we just thought the paper, just writing a solid paper would be the thing we could do. And this was towards the end of 2020. And then at the start of the year, we just hunkered down and said, all right, let's do it. Let's watch the video together as needed. And then spent once or twice a week going through it together. And then towards, and then after going through it a few times and thinking about it, I, I was the first to identify that there was a problem with the Shiab operator. And then things just started piling up from there. So we have four total objections. The Shiab operator was the kind of the undoing and still remains the biggest undoing of, of geometric unity. And we, so we, we wrote the paper and we released it in February. And th there's actually an interesting issue with the release that we can get to. I, I've spoken for a bit, but yeah, there, there's more details about some of the obstacles with the release we can talk about, but that's the backstory behind the inception of the response in geometric unity. That's, that's great, Tim. And uh, there's a bunch of details I want to pull a bit on there before we move out. But some things that struck me is first, as you mentioned, there's the connection that you actually are one of the figures that Dan outlined in the previous interview when we were talking about the Discord dynamics with Eric. So it's interesting that you are one of the characters that were central referenced in that. And then also the fact that in Eric's world, in, there's an array of forces arranged against him, which are hell-bent on taking him down. And he's, I think he's subtly hinted if you at least the way I read his friends, that our podcast exists purely to destroy him. And uh, the, the, the unfortunate thing is you, you mentioned that the interview with Dan helped inspire your paper. It's, uh, it's in some sense supporting that, that theory. So we, we legitimately may be Eric's disc. Like this random podcast is the grand institution slamming him down. But the other thing that struck me, and I think this is really important to emphasize because like you, I would even say, while I was skeptical of Eric, maybe a bit earlier, I regarded Eric as the most intellectually capable member of the intellectual dark web and the strangest character that seemed to have interests that extended beyond the typical culture war topics and to, to be a potential intellectual powerhouse in really you mean, you, mean, you mean even above jordan peterson and sam harris yes because i basically had spent very little time with eric's content until the portal came out but when i saw some interview with Eric, Jordan, and I think Brett, and it was on Dave Rubin. And Eric's kind of just gallop of economics term and physics terms. And when you first encounter it, it's quite persuasive. And he seems to, like you intimated, he can talk the talk to an extent where it's not just garbled nonsense. It is real reference to actual economic theory and physics theories and so on. So. Initially, I had a relatively 
positive opinion, except for the teal connection, right? That that immediately raised red flags. But then as I spent any amount of time with Eric's content, I think the mask quickly peels away. But the point I wanted to emphasize, and I think it's important, is that you started out sympathetic to his position and actually in favor of what he was trying to do. The the whole idea of the portal is supposed to be that you'll introduce these voices who have been sidelined from the mainstream, from academia, and, and introduce people to an alternative source for interesting ideas. And I think it's worth noting that now, since your paper has come out and how things progressed on the Discord, that you're now seen as somebody who is fundamentally unsympathetic to Eric's agenda. And in many respects, you're now a villain in his cast of characters that are aligned against him. And it's just interesting how far that is from the reality. It seems like there was a lot of good faith and even scope now, I think, that if Eric engaged with the criticism in a meaningful way that you and Theo have produced, I get the impression that you guys would welcome proper interaction, even though your criticisms are quite deep about his theory. So is that accurate or is it now at the stage where you essentially regard Eric as irredeemable charlatan? Um, like, <laughs> where, where are you at this yeah, stage? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question because among the many things we can dive into, the, the, the broader context of your question is how do we view our quote unquote enemies, you know, by enemies, I mean, in an intellectual sense, not in any militaristic sense or anything like that. But all the criticisms we're going to talk about in terms of Eric or, you know, Brian Keating, you know, none of this is personal, right? I mean, all of this is purely at the level of ideas. And as much as we might get snarky or whatever, that's part of the banter, part of the part of theatrics. But at the end of the day, we're interested in the ideas. And in my case, if Eric wanted to have a civil conversation and shake hands and talk about math and, and science proper, I would, I would be more than happy. And even more, I would be happy if Theo and I were wrong, because if we are wrong and Eric is right, then there's much more to gain from a new theory of physics than my bruised ego. So I, I would be happy to be wrong. Unfortunately, I just don't see, I'd say, I think it's more likely than that our criticism is correct than Eric has something he's hiding that's going to change the world of physics. Can I ask one thing as well? So there's the context here, I, which I think uh, there's two things that are worth mentioning. So your expertise is in mathematics, right? I don't know the cyber witten equations, but I know it's connected to physics. But Theo, his expertise is in physics, is that right? That's right. So, so right. I have a PhD in math. I, I do have a background in physics and as much as I studied quantum filter, I've written papers on it. But you know, in terms of like ratios though, my stronger advantage is in mathematics and, and Theo's. PhD is in, is in physics. And I, I also want to highlight at this point, because this is all well known, I think, to all of the people in this discussion, but for people listening, maybe not, that Theo Polya is a pseudonym. Your co-author is pseudonymous. And this has been a point that Eric has grasped onto to infer that there is something malevolent, potentially a cabal of people who have PhDs intent on taking him down. So the response that he has issued to your your paper has been, the way I would characterize it is as character assassination. He includes you whenever he's talking about a kind of unspecified group of malevolent forces, but those malevolent forces he intimates are misogynistic, making threats towards his family and in general, a, a kind of 4chan group online. Before, sorry, before, before you go, Eric, I was actually wondering uh, specifically when we'll hear like a debate uh, with uh, you and Theo and Timothy about G. Sorry, who's Theo? Uh, Timothy and Theo, they put out the retort to- Sorry, Jim who's and Theo? Yeah. Uh, Theo Polia and Timothy- yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not aware of Theo Polia. Where did, we don't uh, know who he is. Yeah, we have Who's to know Theo who he is. <laughs> uh, Do you know who Timothy Wynn is? Let's talk about Theo Polia. Who's Theo Polia? He's the co-author from the paper. Who is with he? Timothy Wynn. Yeah, who is he? I don't know. That that wasn't the question, though. No, right? That is the question. No, the question was. No, that is going... the question. No, you you're not understanding. Yeah, you yeah, no, you're not Polly understanding me. I've never heard there. in the history of physics anybody expecting 
to be taken seriously as an anonymous uh, critic. And the behavior of those gentlemen, however many there are, two or more, including uh, various misogynistic comments against my colleagues, um, disrespecting Sabina Hassenfelder, who, uh, while she may be a critic, is also a friend of mine. I'm fucking sick of these two people, assuming it is two people. Maybe it's... But we don't know what Theopolia is. And so I want to give you space to, to respond to any of that, but in particular... The issue, and whether you think there is any concern with having the co-author remain anonymous, and then the second point about, are you a misogynist troll on 4chan? <laughs> but I just, I, I want to highlight that that is how Eric has characterized you, you two, and your response to that, or how you felt being publicly identified as that, right. because Eric has quite a big platform. Yeah, I mean, I was appalled, but, you know, I... I was appalled more for Eric than for me, just because I felt it was so over the top that, and and I think I have enough of a profile that I'm probably immune to that, especially because he implicated that I was misogynistic towards Sabine specifically, who is, is like the worst choice of target because she's the one hosting the blog post of our paper released and I interviewed her at Google. So I don't, I, I find that the most strange choice of person to target. She is a physicist, just to mention for in case anybody right. who doesn't know. Right. Right. Sabine, well yeah. oh, Sabine Hostetter. Right. She's a well-known physicist, has a popular blog, and certainly her blog posting uh, legitimized our cheek even more and got it greater visibility. The funny thing is some of my friends were like, hey, maybe, maybe you might want to take some legal action or something. But actually, I don't think he actually legally slanderizes us. He just sort of says, oh, these guys are associated with people that are this. And so if we were to be really litigious, it wouldn't hold up in a court of law, I think. But uh, not that I would necessarily pursue that anyways, but I just sort of, I think to the extent that it was intentional, a clever sleight of hand where you can dodge the bullet by just substituting the two of us for another group and just keep going down that rabbit hole without ever going back to the original topic. Yeah, no, definitely. And that, that you noticed that as well, Matt. Right? Well, this is a pattern, not just with Eric, but with related gurus that they are, are quite good at hedging their language so as to imply quite extreme things without actually saying it explicitly. And it feels like the audience gets the message loud and clear, but they're not actually held to something. Right. You know, as far as I can tell, Eric has, has never mentioned my name. He's only harping on, on Theo because he's the anonymous one. But, you know, for example, in the video, someone asked, what about Timothy? And Eric said, I, let's talk, I want to talk about Theo. The funny thing is he's, he's talked to both of us. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's Theo's assertion that, that Eric knows who Theo is just based on some contextual clues and things like that. Theo has a, has a different username on Discord and he interacted with Eric with that username. And the evidence is that Eric is aware of that connection, but is kind of ending otherwise. He certainly knows who I am, but he sort of refuses to acknowledge me. And uh, I, I suppose we can speculate as to why, but, but he, he has not mentioned me by name at all in, in this whole thing, which is kind of strange because he keeps talking about pseudonymity, but that only applies to half <laughs> of the co-authors. What about the other uh, co-author? His, his version of why that's legitimate is that if he highlights the people that are making the critiques that this is your goal you want him to mention him on his podcast or so on like that you're you're doing your critique for the in in no no, no because you're not a, i'm gonna mute you if you don't keep it up all right you're muted now i think you're not understanding what i'm saying standards and we don't allow anonymous people to pull bullshit like this and we don't allow people in general to go around making a name for themselves by being um, obnoxious, misogynistic, manipulative, and it's fucking enough. And this isn't very high quality critique. So my feeling about this is um, we, can, we can talk about this some other way, but the, the key feature of this little drama is to try to get me to mention their server and the whole way it got started was the people on an informal ser server uh, that was set up for me that we should not tolerate bad behavior in our colleagues. And so when we kicked out a bunch of these people, you got something like, 
you know, the archive meets 4chan. And 4chan is not going, 4chan doesn't have a future in science. Wait, may I jump real quick, please? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of irritated. Like, right. I'm, I'm here I on understand. stage with people. Yeah, but like, I don't want to be subjected to this. For me, that that's his legitimation as to why I think avoids mentioning people by name. So last last point about this specific thing. But the So why did Theo choose to be an I mean, I mean, there's lots of reasons that I can imagine. Is there a particular reason that, you know, he just didn't want the personal attention for this or? Yeah, basically he doesn't want the attention, you know, where he is in his, his career and things like that. He's still, uh, so he's not an academic. He, he left after he got his PhD. You know, if you're on the job market, if you're looking to grow in your career and maybe there's the small chance that someone Googles you and sees that you're part of this nonsense and that yeah, yeah. the yeah. chance that that might negatively impact you, he just doesn't want to take risk. So that's the reason. Yeah, that's entirely understandable. That's, that's, that's the like, reason, yeah. Me, I feel you know much more secure in, in where I am and yeah. Yeah, now that's a genuine issue. Actually, I just wanted to make one more point because we might forget it. And I thought it was very interesting and ironic. So if you actually listen to that video with Eric and Brian Keating, he mentions that when someone asked him about a paper being released, says, oh, if the paper wasn't put out, it was rejected from the archive. So actually, I only mentioned it once in a clubhouse room that it was rejected from the archive. And I guess Eric has the ears of the spies to, to have learned that and unfortunately tried to mislead and weaponize it against us. Great. So, so sorry. I mean, characters no, no, no. So there is a yeah, paper uh, that was put out rebutting geometric unity. Right. No, there so, wasn't a paper that was put out rebutting geometric unity. There was an attempt to publish something on the archive, which was rejected, that attempted to get in front of the draft that I put out. Um, so here's, here's an interesting thing about the release of the paper. So we released it on a Tuesday on my WordPress through Twitter, but it was supposed to be released through the archive, which we sent to the archive over the weekend. And it was actually rejected. And we were very disappointed. Maybe just to explain to everyone, the archive is this preprint server where people can upload papers that are not yet peer reviewed. There's still a, a light moderation system in that either you're at a, a university or you need some kind of sponsorship if you're not. And in my case, I've already have published papers on the archive, so that wasn't an issue. So we uploaded the paper and the rejection came back saying that the content wasn't suitable, like a very short one line kind of thing. The explanation was that this was not publishable content, something like that, very vague and short. We thought that was ridiculous because it's a preprint server. So the point is that it, it, these papers aren't yet published. And if you look at the scope of things that are on the archive, there's lecture notes, there's memoirs, there's all kinds of things which wouldn't be in a journal. So just straight up, that was not an honest answer. And of course, we, we read between the lines. The problem was that we're responding to content that is of you know, very minimal scientific value, is certainly in terms of its format, right? You're responding to this video of this guy. <laughs> So we were very disappointed and, and, and we relayed this to Sabine Hassenfeller. She also wrote to the archive in our behalf. We also wrote back with this very long explanation of, oh, but look at all, look at all this stuff that's going on, on on YouTube, Brian Keating, bringing on all these physicists to discuss it. This this really about informing the public, blah, blah, blah. And they still responded with the one line. This time I wrote like this really long rebuttal and, they, and their, their response again was, if you get it published in a journal, we might consider it for the archive. So we were just, wow, really disappointed. And and that's why we released it on Twitter. But uh, the reason I also brought this up, not only because it's an interesting story, but really shame on the archive. I really do want to publicly shame the people who, who did this. I mean, they're, they're not referees. The, the moderators do say that they're they're not referees. They didn't referee the paper, of course, because they did it in such a short amount of time. They couldn't have read our paper and Eric's YouTube. But in terms of like, it, what's really ironic about this story is that Eric keeps complaining about the suppression, the disc, blah, blah, blah. But the response to his work <laughs> Is it so, was itself a form of suppression, not because there was some earth shattering stuff to be suppressed, but because the thing that it was critiquing was not even worth critiquing in the eyes of the, the, the moderators, right? Um, but this becomes this kind of weird, vicious circle where if you can't debunk something because it's not worth debunking, if it has yeah. enough of a large following, then how do you debunk it in the first place? So I'm, I'm really upset about the whole situation. I, I'm glad that basically the situation has corrected itself, but there would be more of a, a stamp of legitimacy if it were on the archive. It's a, it's a very strange thing because there, uh, there are standards for publishing to preprint servers, but they're, they're relatively minimum. That's right. And That's right. In, in my experience, 
I, I don't want to get conspiratorial because right. the, that that would contradict the whole whole point. But you know, if if Eric's characterization was correct, this should be what the disc agents love, right? That there's a takedown of his theory, which is going to upset things, and it can be easily legitimized, or you know, get a little bit more of legitimacy anyway by being hosted on this preprint server, and and it it, it doesn't, right? So it kind of contradicts that narrative, and then. You also have the issue that Eric has reeled against the need to publish, like, and he's even specifically said, you know, preprint servers are also too much of a bar to entry because you have to have an association with a university or, or get somebody uh, to vouch for you. So the fact that he would then switch to say, oh, that paper, which wasn't even accepted on a preprint server. Exactly, exactly. It just shows you how much bad faith he is when he cherry picks how to use you know, using the same argument, but in contradictory way, you shouldn't have to publish on the archive or the archive is a sign of approval. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. So uh, yeah, thanks for flagging that up. Yeah, I'm going to put that in before we forget that. So that, that was really one sort of a, the first dramatic moment of our process of getting our response paper out there. Mm. I might change gears a little bit. I thought it might be useful to just ask a few sort of general questions about unified theories of physics, how many of them are floating around out there, what are the big stumbling blocks, and, and where Eric's idea fits into all of that. And another related question is a uh, more specific one, is just to ask whether or not his paper that came out after yours, whether any extra information in that, did that clear anything up or did it change your view at all? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's see. So yeah, so my, my background is much more in mathematics and, and less in physics, but you know, uh, I'll, I'll explain what I know. So in terms of, of theories of physics, right? So I guess most people know that there's two large pillars of physics. There's quantum mechanics, the physics is very small, and then there's general relativity, sort of the physics of the very big gravity and what Einstein has, uh, one of the great contributions from Einstein. And sort of the holy grail, one of the holy grails of modern physics is to try to unify the two. There's actually sort of two senses of unification. So there's that sense of unification, which is, you know, a holy grail of, of, of physics. But there's also another sense of unification, which is also, you know, important, but not quite the same. So there's something called the standard model of, of particle physics. So there's, you know, four forces in nature. There's uh, gravity, there's electromagnetism, there's the weak force, and there's the strong force. And famously, the standard model encompasses three out of the four. It doesn't encompass gravity. There still remains to be a unified theory of physics because our basic theory of particle physics doesn't include gravity. And so how this ties into unification is that one, another way you can think of unification is how to unify the other three forces. You know, ideally with gravity, but you could also talk about just the weak, the strong, and the electromagnetic. And, and that has to do with gauge theory, essentially. So the sense in which how does this relate to geometric unity? So for geometric unity to be a theory of everything, so to speak, it, it could try to do so in, uh, at least in the sense that the word is used, it could do so in, in either of those two ways to unify, say, the, the, the weak, the strong, and the electromagnetic. Or, and if it were more ambitious, it could also unify it with gravity. But, but certainly one thing that it should do is it also needs to incorporate quantum mechanics uh, and so, so that's the sense in which if Eric is going to call geometric unity, you know, a, a theory of everything, it should do that. Uh, it certainly falls short of, uh, that and we can, we can go into the details. Um, what Eric sketches out or claims at least in his, his work that, you know, he has these equations and from those equations, you're supposed to get the Einstein equations, which is gravity, the Dirac equation which is going to give you electromagnetism and, and the Yang-Mills equation, which gives you the strong and weak force. I mean, those are mutually disjoint, but that, you know, just to give a kind of a superficial description. So from his e uh, equations, you're supposed to pop out these, you know, famous equations that are involved in, in these different forces. The, the thing is that he doesn't, you know, succeed uh, or he just has many gaps. Uh, it's actually quite amazing how tenuous the connection is between his work and what he claims. I mean, a much more scientifically honest title or whatever would just talk about, you know, some of the geometric structures that he proposes en route to that big program. You know, scientists, of course, should be very um, modest or appropriate when uh, titling their papers, right? And, and so 
most scientific papers present an idea partially fleshed out even towards a bigger program. So, you know, so unifying physics is a very big program that's been going on for decades, right? And so the fact that geometric unity has a hint of trying to get there, to say that that warrants calling it a theory of everything is, is, is a huge, huge stretch that no serious mathematician or physicist would take seriously. So, you know, in some sense, already off the bat, you can already smell something's funny because there's such a, a, a large disconnect between what's actually done and what's actually promised or named. Yeah. And yeah. we can go into the details of that. But that, yeah. that's sort of how this, how this ties up. I think that's really useful context. I mean, my knowledge of this stuff is obviously at the level of reading popular books about physics and so on. But even from that, um, I get the imp impression, which you can correct for me if needed, that this is the grand dream of theoretical physics. And the context here, of course, is there's been lots of things proposed, hasn't there? String theory and all kinds of modifications, which don't quite work. And the impression I get is that there are thousands of brilliant people coming up with ideas and making various attempts to do something similar in theoretical physics, but obviously none of them has worked yet. So partially sketched out ideas where you make a couple of interesting connections, but it, 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 there are lots of gaps and it doesn't, it doesn't really do much. They're kind of a dime a dozen. It, it, would I be wrong in making that assumption? I'm not on top of the number of proposals to, to theories of everything. Actually, it's interesting. For example, one of the people that Eric interviews is Garrett Lisi, and he's famous also for having proposed a theory of everything. I forget the exact date, but sometime in the 2000s, I think 2006, because I was a graduate student at MIT at the time. The title of his paper that he put on the archive was An Exceptionally Simple Theory of Everything. And that's a pun on the fact that there are things in mathematics called Lie groups, and, and they can be uh, classified in terms of these so-called simple types. And, and E8 is one of these like, most exotic ones. And he wanted to embed all these different forces, all these different symmetry groups inside E8. And, and E8 is one of these exceptionally, exceptional Lie groups. So that, it's a, sort of a pun, exceptionally mm -hmm. simple theory of everything. Actually, quite a there were a non-trivial number of people that took it seriously or at least saw that there was content to it. I don't know if it lived up to its title, but for example, a mathematician named David Vogan, a professor at MIT, I believe, took it seriously or invited him to give a talk or hosted a workshop, something like that. So my impression is there was, there was content there. Whether it actually leads to through everything is an independent thing. But, you, know, the, you know, many times in science and mathematics, you, you, know, you might not solve the problem you, you set out to do, but there's still some germs of some ideas, right? And, and my impression is there was... There was some construction there. Now, uh, uh, it was sort of, I mean, it had its flaws, but, but, you know, it was at least, and it was certainly put forward in a proper paper, right? Um, so there, there are many attempts like this. And, and, but it's, you know, by comparison, though, geometric unity, it, it, it almost doesn't, it doesn't even meet the bar of like a, of a, of a, of a properly written paper. So there's, yeah, it's, it's very low on the totem pole in terms of, serious proposals yeah so there seems to be a big disconnect between the kind of grandstanding that i've seen from eric on this point and it seems to me that this seems to play an important role in his image and his public presentation which is that of a brilliant genius physicist among other things that is unrecognized by a system that is dominated by a crushing orthodoxy that cannot encompass new ideas such as his. So I guess, you know, perhaps it'd be helpful for you to just spell out what you see are those main issues with geometric unity. I think you've already talked about a couple of them. You've mentioned it kind of falls at the first hurdle in terms of not even clearly explaining what the proposal is, but um, I think there are a few more specific criticisms as well. So in our paper, we highlight four. Um, yeah, and I've already mentioned one of them, this, I think, maybe this this Shiab operator. Um, so so I, I guess I can give maybe a high-level overview of those objections. So they, they come in various types. So just maybe at a high level, things can be flawed for either mathematical reasons or physics reasons. By physics reasons, I mean if you if your theory makes a prediction and the theory and and, and the experiments are otherwise, then that's the, the theory might have been right, but but you know it just didn't get confirmed by experiments. It's not like a logical contradiction, right? But uh, a mathematical mistake is is much more serious, right? Because that means you you can't even logically construct what you're trying to do. 
So, so in the course of writing geometric unity, finding the Shia operator not being definable was sort of the nail in the coffin, so to speak. And then, then we found the subsequent other ones just to flesh out more things. But, but at, at the highest level, there is the Shiab operator, which if you, you could read the paper to go into the details, but Eric tries to construct it and, and, and can't. Actually, it was, what happened was, you know, we were watching the video, he gets to the point where he talks about it, and then I just had to do some inferential stuff about what he said and realized, okay, if, if I actually take him by his word, what he says here, this just can't be right. And and actually, this was vindicated because in his paper release, he says very clearly, and this is also in my tweet in the response to his paper on April 1st, he says he no longer knows how to construct the Shiab operator. He, he openly admits that he no longer knows how to do it, which is a very um, strange thing to do when you're so aggressive promoting your theory of everything to admit that you no longer know how to do it. So well, in some sense, he agrees with us. And if you look at the Joe Rogan show, the only, the only response he makes to our paper was, he says there were three points. There were actually four, but he says there were three. He says two of them are inferential. They're not what I'm doing. And then one, he says, there's one objection, but I would have said it anyways. So it, it was just a very strange reply. But in some sense, he's actually not being dishonest because we said you can't construct the Shia Barbader. He admits it in his paper and he re-admits it on the Joe Rogan show. So I, I don't know. <laughs> kind of meander here, but I don't, I don't even know why there's anything to be discussing at this point, because he's already admitted he doesn't know what he's doing. I like listening to alternate theories, but I don't like when theories are rebutted and then there's no counter argument. And I'm not, I don't care if they're awful people, because if they are, they are. I'm sorry that this is happening to you and that they're being awful. I, I'm really sorry for that. But looking strictly at the actual mathematics of it, I just want more. Like, like you talk about the Shiop operator, but you, you just say, if it can be so defined in the paper. And I, like, I, I just, there's nothing, there's nothing for me to really sink my teeth into when I'm trying to parse through this paper. I think probably like some of the listeners, like the, and you, you don't need to get into it, Tim, because I imagine that it, it requires like some degree of technical competence, but it sounds to me like, the Shiab operator is a core component of a the theoretical model he wants to build. And that if you can't construct that or mathematically justify what you've done there, you the rest of it doesn't matter because it's a fundamental pillar for to build everything else on, That's right. on top of. That's right. So it's uh, maybe, maybe from Eric's perspective, this is me just widely speculating, but he, he might see something like uh, Darwin had evolutionary theory before we understood genetics, right? We, he came up with a, the theory and then later, there were people that were able to flesh out the, the specifics and rebuild from his high level uh, concepts. Although of course, in the case, that's the somewhat the cartoonish version of Darwin because the reality is he spent like decades getting tons of material together to <laughs> prove his, his his theory so he he didn't just have a bright idea and do no work to prove it um a lot of time with muscles and whatnot but um yeah so it, i i heard eric actually on the portal episode where he was i think this was when he released the video for geometric unity that you took a look at that he basically intimated he wants to start a new paradigm in physics that like there's Newtonian physics, there's Einsteinian physics, and now there will be Weinsteinian physics. And, and it was very clear that he was upset that he may potentially not get the, like the acknowledgement with having his name attached to this new era of physics, because he wasn't credited with the cyborg Witten equations, but also I think he's talked about the Yang Mills equations and intimated some knowledge of them uh, as well. So, but how about that? How about the idea that like, let's say if he grants you the Shiab operator that yes, he's forgotten this, this crucial component. Is there enough, like, is that such a flaw that all physicists will be like, then you can, or are there people like Brian, people who may say, well, yes, that's a, that's a problem, that's a significant problem, but you know, the rest of it is still interesting. Mm. Well, that's a great question because you make a very valid point. And, and of course, Eric tries to use it to his advantage that he keeps saying that all theories come out malformed. Rack said that uh, you shouldn't rely on experiment necessarily because the experiment might be falsified, things like that. But not to go into the, that kind of reasoning, which can be very 
poorly applied as, as, as in this case. So I want to say several things. We, we did have four objections. So if you don't like that one, you could also go to pick the other ones, um, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> all, all, which are also really bad. The thing is, and this is, of course, a, a judgment call in terms of requiring the expertise of the aesthetics to know when something is worthy or not. But if something is wrong and worth pursuing, there's usually good reasons, right? Like, because there's, there's sort of some germs of like good ideas. There is an indication that it solves new problems that weren't solvable before in the old framework. You know, things start to align, right? But if you just sort of assert something and it's wrong for a simple reason, then that its wrongness doesn't indicate there's there's nothing that wrongness gives you any insight upon and, and i feel the shia operator is exactly of that sort and you know i was actually looking at eric's uh, gu paper uh, a little bit more closely again today and it, it's sort of sad how many qualifications he keeps making about his isolation and and things like that and it's like if someone were actually it's so strange because he takes himself so seriously outside his paper and then he takes himself less seriously in his paper by making yeah. his qualifications. Because if he genuinely believed he had ideas that are worth pursuing, even if they were flawed or whatever, then he should present it in, he could and should present it in such a way that it's like, oh, I'm passing to you the baton and someone else could take. But he, for example, he has that disclaimer that says he's a entertainer, entertainer. not a physicist and that it's copyrighted and that it can't be built upon. I mean, that already is such the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Um, so it, it just kind of shows you, even at a superficial level, that there isn't really much... Um, no, he does I, have a lot of these mathematical ingredients that one hasn't seen before, but to the extent that there's anything salvageable there, it's certainly not clearly presented. And certainly there's just enough flaws that any hope of it being close to what it promised is just completely uh, obliterated by now. Well, the... the the thing I would want to mention to that is like, to some extent, the people responding to the paper and especially the people that are, you know, positively disposed to Eric, they're kind of acting as if the community is obliged to take seriously any, any suggestion, right? Like that the people should take time to, to look at this. And, you know, your response from the preprint server might suggest otherwise, but I mean, there is no application, right? Like if you can't, as you said, if your theory doesn't produce new results, if it has fundamental flaws in it, yes, people are not going to devote time and effort, generally speaking, to to working it out. And the, the insertion of disclaimers that this is work of entertainment or and, and that kind of thing, yeah, like it's a weird hybrid that it... It does end up, it's kind of hard to discuss because do you regard this as like a self-promoting publicity stunt? Do you regard it as like an earnest effort to outline the theoretical theory? And like to give Eric some credit, like the credit I think he deserves for this, he wrote it down, right? That people were asking him to do that, it seems like for decades, at least since, you know, 2013 or wherever, when he gave the talk at Oxford, people said, yeah, I know it might be interesting, write it down. Like, let, let's see the theory. And it took him however long to actually write it down. He now has it down in the form that it is. And, you know, that I, I would say the response to it has been fairly muted, um, except yourself. And I made this point on the clubhouse um, the other day, but I, I think that the people who have engaged the most directly with the components of Eric's theory on a technical level, are you and feel? You wrote a paper and you did, in a sense, what Eric asked for, engage with the theory, highlight what technical issues are. And then, you know, he can dismiss people like us as low quality, uh, like bobblehead internet commentators. You know, we are psychologists and anthropologists and we, we claim no mathematical expertise, but you and feel, Regardless if the, he agrees with the criticisms or not, you, you engaged what seems to me like earnestly and a, that the response was to just completely dismiss you and kind of chastise the community for not taking it more seriously. So I, I find that really disheartening. And I, I, I think his community must notice that to some extent, because I, I don't know if you saw, but on the Reddit where it kind of justified the with 
the lack of episodes to the portal um, to your paper and, and various critics uh, criticizing Did him. Did he say that? He implied that he's not producing new episodes of the portal because there's a cadre of uh, PhD uh, students and, uh, and academics who are hell-bent on like criticizing them. So you were, you're certainly within that category. I see, I see. And the Reddit, but the Reddit to their credit, I was quite impressed. We're basically saying this, like, you know, he's, he's going on other podcasts and <laughs> like, like, why wouldn't he just respond to them? So I think there's an extent, you know, members of it all do see through it, but um, I, I realized this is one of this, it's more of a comment than a question, <laughs> things that academics, yeah. academics do. But uh, yeah, I, it, it's, the response is disappointing. Brian Keating, a figure that you've mentioned, a, a kind of relatively popular physics uh, promoter online. Um, also, it should be said, somebody who produces videos for Prager University or has done. So there's, <laughs> there's certainly issues there. But um, he, he joined with Eric in essentially, well, let, let's set them aside because they, you know, their critique it is in bad faith. And I, I just thought that's a shame. You know, if they can't deal with the objections that you have in your paper, even if they don't do like you as a people, right. as you know, right. on a personal level, we don't want to talk to Tim and Theo, fine. But they could just rebut, he could, he could just rebut that's the right. argument. So first, I didn't actually know who they were until after I tried to read your paper. And I tried to parse through and understand what you were talking about with the Shiab operator stuff. And like, like, and then I found out who they were, and then I found out that there was no discussion between, and, and there's been no, like, private or public, I haven't heard of any way of coming back and arguing against their critique. And I'm not saying that it's them in particular. I don't care Who's about these people. Who's No, you're not understanding me yet. I'm not putting up with misogyny. I'm talking about the math, I'm not Eric. Putting up, and I'm, I'm not putting up with threats against my family. And I'm not you putting shouldn't. up with any of the stupid shit that that server engages in. Capish? Great. Am I, I clear? Agree, Eric. I agree. You should not be subjected to any character assassination. You should not be subjected to threats. That's bullshit. I think we can all agree with that. I'm talking strictly about the math. No, I'm talking strictly, and I said something to you. Rape jokes aren't funny. Are we clear? Who thinks they're funny? I agree. That server. Uh, great. So they shouldn't be listened to. But there's no, still a No, I don't deal with problem. that server. You're not understanding me repeatedly. I don't deal with people from that server. Okay, then just talk to me about your theory. And like, are, like I want to know if there's like, so is there going to be a follow-up? That, that's the first question. I mean, I'm following it up. Um... It's it's such a pity on so many levels. I mean, so prior to the response paper, there were only basically a handful of people that could assess Eric's work. I think um, I think I probably underestimate how particular my and Eric's knowledge is with gauge theory, but I'm sure in your fields too. When you do a PhD, you become the expert in your topic, and there's maybe only a dozen or two dozen other people that are really well versed in it at least with, by only spending a reasonable amount of time going through it, right? And so I happen to be one of those people, right? And actually, yeah, I didn't mention earlier, but I felt also it's like my moral obligation to write this up because if I don't do it, no, nobody else will. And, and in that regard, I think Brian Keating is certainly guilty of, I think, building up the hype around geometric unity by having these puppet physicists go up, who of course are distinguished physicists, but they don't have quite the right background to to challenge Eric on this and to make it look like there's like a, a real controversy. And, and the irony is now when someone with the exact right background to comment on it does so, they're not interested in having a conversation. I mean, I don't have to be a part of the conversation, but the topic should be part of the conversation. And they're not interested in, in the topic either. So that's certainly very disappointing. I guess to a large degree, Eric does believe in himself and does believe that he is onto uh, a theory of everything that will revolutionize physics. But the more cynical part of me believes that this entire thing is largely performative. His identity is strongly grounded in presenting himself as an exiled genius. And geometric unity, just like with his brother who has revolutionary ideas about evolution that are also unrecognized by the field, you know, these claims play a big role in 
bolstering their public persona. So it doesn't surprise me at all, frankly, that any good faith engagement, critical engagement, actually treating these proposals with the respect that they're asking for would be rebutted in such an aggressive fashion. They don't exist for that purpose. They exist for the purpose of buttressing their image. Yeah, and I think maybe this is a good point to talk about Brian Keating because he's a mysterious figure in all of this. I, I don't know the man personally, just like I don't know Eric personally, but from what I can see, he's a, a legitimate and accomplished scientist. He's a distinguished professor of astrophysics. I made sure to read the book, uh, his book, Losing the Nobel Prize. I forget the exact title, but it's, it's about astrophysics, his journey through it, and how the things he worked on took him on the path to the Nobel Prize, but then things didn't work out. First of all, the book's well-written. It's good humor and, and, and personal touch, but also in a scientific sense in that I think he did a really great job explaining the physics, that fine line between not dumbing down things too much, but also giving you some real substance, talking about the Big Bang, inflation, things like that. So, so the long story short is that I feel that the man who wrote that book, the Brian Keating who wrote that book, is a proper scientist and, and shows the nuance of controversy and difficulty in science. That Brian Keating is not the same Brian Keating that is subservient to all of Eric's temper tantrums and things like that. And I think that's a really interesting question that I don't really understand. If I'm going to speculate, there must be some personal connection that, that they have. Eric claims that his family deserves three Nobel Prizes himself for the Cedric Whitney equation. Then there's Brett with the whole Carol Greider affair. And I guess the third one must be his, his wife. And Keating has a book about losing the Nobel Prize, right? But there's a big difference because... Keating goes into very close detail about all the, the nuances. There's something called uh, inflation for explaining how the Big Bang happened. And one of the big projects that Keating worked on was to discuss these so-called B-mode polarization. These B-mode polarizations that are supposed to validate inflation. So it would be like one of these discoveries of the century where you can actually see like the fingerprint of the Big Bang. When the press release came out about this big discovery that they had found these B-modes, he was basically slighted. His contribution was mentioned in a footnote. He was marginalized, so he was upset about that. But then the second reason why there wasn't a Nobel Prize was because basically the, the results were invalidated later that year with some more precise measurements. So that's what happened with that project. But the point I want to emphasize is that he writes an entire book going through all the trials and tribulations of what it's like to be a scientist, to have competition, to be slighted by your colleagues, to then have your work discredited in the media and to explain how a science can be overhyped. So he goes through it in such detail and with a level of thoughtfulness that, yeah, like it's legitimate writing based on my experience of what the scientific process is like. And it, it shows the integrity that you would expect of, of a scientist who goes through the roller coaster of su success. But if he were to apply those same criteria of his own life to Eric, Eric wouldn't stand a chance to be taken seriously. And I just wonder um, what's going on there? Like, you know, the, the so-called Nobel disease exists as well, right? People get Nobel Prizes and go on to endorse homeopathy or uh, 5G conspiracies or whatever the case may be. And it, it's happened so much that it has a name attached to it. But the other thing, and this is speculation on my part, I'm completely flagging that up, but Brian Keating, I've only done cursory look into his content but one of the things that jumped out immediately was the collaboration with prager you and in particular he seems to have produced a video about arguing that god is a more likely explanation than the multiverse i, I believe brian is religious and uh he does, he does admit that in his in his book but yeah um and whatever you take of that argument i have also seen things about brian having more conservative political views and i think if you're in the heterodox space or even the leaning conservative space, that voices like Eric's, there is a natural sympathy there. Eric presents himself as a figure who's beyond the partisan divide. But in my experience, both of the Weinstein brothers tend to be receptive to people who are presenting themselves as black sheep, either on a theoretical or political level. And I think there's some degree of overlap there because I suspect most mainstream academics would not produce a Prager U video. So I, I just think there's an overlap there potentially along a political angle as well as a scientific one. So... I think that might 
alongside what you outlined, Tim, with the disappointment surrounding the Nobel experience that Brian had. For full that, context, can you tell me what's the deal with Prager University? I'm not fully aware of what... Oh, sorry. Prager. So uh, Dennis Prager is a conservative activist, commentator, so on, but he has a website, a kind of YouTube channel that uh, produces these short videos that are usually repackaging some conservative position into a digestible video to share. But mm -hmm. the videos have included things arguing for intelligent design or it's kind of Christian conservatism mixed in. So against global warming and so on as oh, well. Oh, I see. I, yeah, I mean, of course, there's the more broad issue of scientists that comment on things that they're not qualified to and yet they, they're viewed with certain authority. Uh, that's like maybe the most mild form. And then there's maybe scientists that... I don't know, espouse, espouse some interesting or weird theological views or whatever. Um, I think this one's most interesting because the endorsement of Eric Weinstein is a different category. I, don't, I think they're on orthogonal axes, right? Like you can be a fundamentalist astronomer and that has, I, I can see no bearing on why you would be seduced by Eric Weinstein. They're just different variables going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, because I'm trying to think, like if I'm trying to be charitable, right? I try to think like, okay, so uh, the, the Brian Keating that wrote his book and the Brian Keating that's endorsing Eric Weinstein, those seem like two different people and I have to ask why. And it's like, I just can't think of a good reason because I'm trying to think to, to a scientist, your integrity is your, almost your most important thing. And I don't know of any scientist that would sacrifice his or her integrity for, for a few extra YouTube clicks, which is like the most obvious reason why someone would do that. And I just, I just don't, I don't understand the dynamic. I think... It has to be what Matt says, the compartmentalization is a thing. And like you mentioned that you can't see how the person who could write that could then be focused on increasing clicks and views on YouTube. But a lot of that depends on what's Brian's future goals and what's he doing now? Is he still focusing on being a researcher and working or is he focusing on building a YouTube audience. And I'm not even saying that it has to be an intentional strategy, just that that creates different incentives and it can lead to these kind of changes that we, that we can see with Nobel laureates as well. So it's an interesting case, but it'll be interesting to see how it continues. But I think given the dynamics that we've sketched out here and your paper, that if Brian makes the error of tying himself too strongly to Eric's case, I suspect that would be a bad move for him in terms of credibility as a mainstream physicist. So yeah, we'll, I guess we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there's both this sort of um, F the system dynamic going on where because Brian got close to the Nobel but didn't get it or he got spurned also by his colleagues and so he has that bond with Eric and now it's like you know what all my colleagues are a bunch of hacks I, you know, I'm tenured I can do whatever I want so why not just just take liberty with this and I don't care right so maybe maybe there's some of that I don't have a problem with these personality quirks if they were just personality quirks we're all weird in our own way and they're free human beings to do whatever they want I think one of the main issues and I think a recurring theme of your of this podcast is just what is the effect it's having on the wider view of science and the way it's done? And I was also talking to Joseph, the, the, the person who actually was interrogating Eric on that clubhouse. And, and he agreed with me also that this is bad for the perception of science and also sort of a knock on the respectability of Brian Keating. This is what makes it worse that Brian Keating's involved because that just throws a bunch of confusion. Because if you look at some of the Reddit discussion, it's like, oh, you know, Brian Keating's a professor. So he's more qualified than Tim. He's brought on Max Tegmark and Sabine and Wolfram. And so it, it's really damaging when people don't know how to evaluate science. So they rely on authority figures. And if they try to string the theatrics in such a way as to mislead people, then that's, that's where it becomes very damaging. Yeah, I think that's a good way to sum up, actually. I mean, as you say, this is a thing we're very concerned with, that when people with PhDs, when people with some degree of scientific uh, or academic standing go down uh, a path which is not entirely dissimilar from Alex Jones, then it has a disproportionate effect on public understanding of science, whether it's physics or vaccines or whatever. And their behavior also seems to be geared towards undermining public trust and faith 
in scientific institutions. And, and that's why it's important. We, we don't have great concerns for the physics establishment being destabilized by silly theories, right? That's, that's not going to happen. But what does happen is that the public can become entirely misled as to how genuine scientific research occurs. So I, Tim, I think in, in this little episode, which you've engaged with, and I think done a great service by engaging with Eric's theory the way you have, um, will hopefully perhaps help a tiny little bit in counteracting those forces. I got to say, Tim, like there's two things that pop to mind. So first of all, thank you for detailing all the things that you have. I think it's really helpful. But the, the two things that struck me, one, as I'm sure you've experienced now, when people criticize you and they're critiquing something which isn't accurate, like that they view you as somebody that wants to destroy Eric Weinstein and that your life's goal is built around this, it, it's not accurate, right? It doesn't land. So in, in the same way with me and Matt, we joke around about people describing as a Weinstein hater cast, but the reality is that Eric and Brett are just new versions of this thing that I've been interested in a long time, which is uh, kind of conspiracy theorists and pseudoscience communities. And it'll be around many decades after they're gone and after I'm dead, the next generation will have new, new figures. So in this sense, they're just players. We're all just playing roles in bigger systems. Eric might like that, but I, I think the critique doesn't sting that personally, when people characterize you in a way that it just doesn't land, that's not actually what you're about and doing. And in many respects, I think that, like I said earlier, you are focusing on the theory such as it exists in all its flaws and your paper doesn't include critiques of Eric the man, right? We've discussed loads of his personal flaws here on this episode, but your paper does not address that. It's purely focused on the theory. And in in that respect, it, yeah, like if it was all true, it should stand apart from the individual personal squabbles or individual characteristics of the people. It's about the maths and about the physics, and that's where it falls down. And the extra layer that me and Matt are focused on is the kind of social dynamics and psychological techniques that people are using. But in in your case, I think it's just important to keep that in mind that you produced a piece of work which was focused on the science, focused on the maths, and, and that's where the critique lies, but that's not where it's engaged on. It's engaged right. in a that's right. personal I mean, level. Clear, as sadly consistent with the archive decision, our paper is not a contribution to science. It's a contribution to debunking science, right? Like there's like reading my paper won't teach you anything new about the universe. It will just tell you why there were some bad arguments, right? And so, yeah, it, and in some ways it's comical to see people still take it so seriously. Oh, Eric responded with these things, right? And, and what about this and that? And they're, they're sort of missing the point. There was a reason why the academic community didn't engage with Eric before, and even more so now, both with the quality of his write-up and certainly with also with RG already having done the job, everyone else their time. Um, so basically, Eric's never going to get any more serious criticism after this, I would imagine, unless it's some other people who want to do so, but certainly not the academic community. So th there, there might never, never be any uh, high quality criticism of, of, of GU based upon Eric's response thus far. The discussion really is at the level of scientific integrity. I, I think Eric has basically conceded that he doesn't really have any good response to our criticism. So it's unlikely that there will actually be any meaningful scientific engagement in terms of, oh, let's actually sit down, look at the equations, resolve. I, I don't see that happening. I'd be happy if that were to happen, but I just don't see that happening. But it, Tim, the last thing that I'll say is that even though I sincerely doubt Eric will ever reach that point, I think your paper existing has had the that impact. The appearance on Joe Rogan, the last one, was notably more critical than in previous incarnations. His fans on the subreddit didn't endorse his deflections about not releasing podcasts. And I think in general, when you're in the public eye, there'll always be a core which will never, never doubt and the kind of true faithful. But I, 
from observing the arc of Eric, I, I think it's fair to say that it's bending towards skepticism of his claims in the public sphere. And, and you played a part in that. And I, I have no personal ill will towards Eric Ehler, but I think it is good for all the reasons that we've discussed that grandiose claims that present the academic community and, and institutions as fundamentally evil, flawed forces that you can't trust, especially during global pandemics and this kind of thing. Uh, it's worth pushing back on that. So yeah, just uh, thank you for chatting with me and Matt about it. It's been very entertaining and interesting. And uh, yeah, and, and thanks for the paper as well. And pass on our thanks to Theo. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I want to say that almost ironically, it's almost strange that Eric and I should be on opposite tables because we should really be working together, right? We studied the same math and physics. It's actually strange that we're actually not, not like somehow on the same side. It's uh, Tim, Tim, the fact that you say that tells me that you are thinking like a normal human being and a physicist <laughs> and not like a guru. I'm sorry, there was never any chance of that, but I'll thank you as well. I'll just say that similar to Chris, I, I think there was absolutely no chance of your good faith engagement and criticism being uh, responded to in kind. However, it was very helpful for that to have occurred. Although it can often feel like one's playing whack-a-mole with pseudoscientific and conspiratorial theories that are out there, it's an important thing to do, not for the scientific enterprise, but for the public understanding of science. And hopefully a few people, as Chris said, that they'll always be the true believers, but I think more than a few people from little episodes like this can get diverted to better popularizers of science. So thank you again, Tim. Yeah, you're welcome.